Well, <clears throat> hello. Today's date, it is December 30th of 2016. This year is almost over with. This is a video blog. So I'm going to discuss a few little things and then I'm going to go into story time. Which is going to be a regular feature from now on. Uh, I did a blog entry about uh, <clears throat> handguns in the USA, and there's a link to it in my blog. And they were talking about the the five best-selling handguns in the United States, and that they're people pick them because of being compact, lightweight, and accurate uh, for concealed carry. And then they go through and, and list them. And uh, I should have included the, uh, the picture. In, but I talked about the fact that uh, for 30 years, <clears throat> for over 30 years, I had to carry daily, basically, a firearm at work. I didn't mention in there that in all that time, I never had to shoot anyone. I was shot at once. Um, I, I also mentioned that I, I didn't mention and that I never had an accidental firearm uh, go off. Never had an accidental discharge of my firearm. If you wonder why I'm wearing a hat, I hate hats. <clears throat> I've always hated hats. I've had to wear hats. Uh, but I, I, I suspect that my parents, my mother left me, maybe I have a head that was not, maybe she left me in the crib laying on my side or, you know, something didn't pick me up enough. I don't know. But I hate hats and my head was not made for hats. <clears throat> Some of the hospitals, none of the uh, police jobs that I had, I ever actually have to wear a hat. Some of the security jobs that I had, and then the welding jobs that I had for about 10 years, you needed to wear, you know, you needed to wear a hard hat. I was also wearing a hood, you know, the, when I wasn't wearing a hard hat, I was <clears throat> for welding. Uh, but for the last year or two or whatever, I got a ding on the top of my head, which scabs over. And finally, when the scab comes off, there's this little abrasion area, and then the scab starts again, and it looks gross, I think. So I'm, sometimes I put this hat on. That's the reason I have a hat on. I'm not a hat person. Uh, that reminded me of a story. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I had this blog entry about, about guns. My God, now tons of people rush there, you know. Uh, and I mentioned that <clears throat> my, that I owe, over the years, I never owned a, when they, when they first announced about the Glocks, that they were, I'm not sure they said plastic, polymer, or whatever, I and tons of other people who had to use or wanted to own a firearm or something said, I'm not owning a plastic pistol. And that was me also. And uh, turns out, that Glocks turned out to be really good weapons, and uh, plastic did, did you know didn't turn out to be a problem. Plastic, polymer, or whatever the hell they were made out of, it turned out to be more dependable. Maybe than uh, over the years, I carried uh, blue steel, uh, stainless steel. Uh, was it nickel? I had um, 
nickel for some reason activated the mm -hmm. echo dot. The all new echo dot allows you to talk to me in more rooms in your home. It includes a built in speaker, but you can also connect to external speakers using Bluetooth or line out. See the Alexa app for more information. I can't say that word. Apparently nickel activates it. No, it didn't. Was it a nickel fire on that I had? I can't remember. Anyway, over the years I had quite a few firearms uh, that I carried on duty. And uh, my favorite of all, I should have included the, the and this is this is a picture I really like also. You know, now we have so many pictures of us, you know, selfies and all kinds of things. <clears throat> but, you know, I don't have any, I think this is the only picture I have in working over 30 years. No, I, I can think of, okay, there was one in the emergency room at Research Belt and Hospital. But uh, I... Uh, That's at St. Joseph Hospital. It would have been about 1972, 73 in there. And oh, I'm holding it up to the microphone. It might be better if I... <clears throat> the revolver is a Smith & Weston four-inch barrel, but it is uh, a 3844. It's a 44 frame, but it's a 38 revolver, and it was a big, it was a big gun, and uh, big revolver, 38 revolver. But uh, it's the only picture I have at my the first hospital that I worked at, St. Joseph Hospital. Second hospital I worked at, Trinity Lutheran Hospital. There's no pictures of me in there at the hospital. Might be one my mother or somebody took it maybe at home before I went to work or something. Uh, done at Research Medical Center. Now, I, anyway, I didn't want to go into that. Just wanted to go into, <clears throat> I sold that gun. I wish I'd have kept it. It was a beautiful, beautiful weapon. The, the, the 38 on the 44 frame. And that's when that was in a bad neighborhood, the worst neighborhood in Kansas City, by the way, at the time. Well, out of 10 security officers working here, uh, and in the three and a half year period that I worked there, we had one who was shot and permanently disabled. <clears throat> Although he did, he, he did come back to work. And you can't tell this, but or maybe you can. The steps are leading up. This was in a the Lenwood parking lot that all the employees parked in, that was only open Monday through Friday, surrounded by big big fence. All the employees parked there. These stairs led up to a guard shack that was up up in the air. And so after he was shot, after Dan was shot and recovered, it took him a long time to recover. He came back to work and they put him there in that shack and he sat there with a gun, with his gun on the counter. So he could, it wouldn't even any holster, I don't think, unless he left the, you know. And all of us who worked with him were afraid that if some young black man was someplace and he got a call Hey, your wife is at St. Joseph Hospital. She's having the baby, you know. The guy would have jumped into his car, raced down to the hospital, and if he didn't know the hospital, he would see this parking lot, and he would drive into the parking lot very fast, and there probably wouldn't have been a parking spot unless he got there right when employees were coming in. I was afraid, you know, he would pull in real fast, jump out of his car, see the guard up there, and decide to run up and ask the guard 
you know, uh, where's the OB unit, my wife, you know, whatever, where can I park or whatever. And I was afraid that Dan would have blown him away. So we kept telling Dan, Dan, you ought, you know, and so finally he, finally he quit. We had another security officer, John Gallegos, who was uh, shot and killed in the parking lot there at the hospital also. So it was a bad neighborhood. And why did I mention that? Just talking about guns, I guess. Um, I wanted to mention something too before I get into story time. I think I was already in story time. Oh, but back to that subject. I wish we had digital cameras back then. I, you know, I don't have any, a picture of me. I spent ten, ten years working uh, welding. I have no pictures of me at work welding. I worked at a. I went down to Convent, we from Kansas City, Missouri. I went down to. I'll be mentioning that in a story because it's, because I got fired there. Uh, I'll probably be mentioning that at some point. Uh, no pictures of me in Convent, Louisiana. I worked at a Texaco refinery. That's before OSHA. And if you've seen pictures of refineries, I should have put, you know, shite towers that run way up and, you know. And that was before OSHA, so they was just on the side of the tower were pieces of metal that welders like myself had tacked on there. I guess hopefully we more didn't tack them more than a tack, but and so you know I climbed way up there. I had never been out on a, on a field a job for the Boilermakers Union. That I was a welder and member of the Boilermakers Union, later a member of the United Auto Workers. Union. Uh, never been on a field job, so before I went to that, I bought a, a book on ropes and not, well, on knots, and practiced tying knots. And when I got down to, actually, I was in on my way to Pascagoula, Mississippi, to the shipyards there. My father and mother, when World War II started, they went to California. They both got jobs building Liberty ships, and they were both members of the Boilermakers Union. And of course, after the war, my father came, father, mother, and I came back from California to Kansas City. My mother got, you know, a woman's type job, you know, secretary, and eventually she went to nursing school, what have you. My father continued his entire life to be a Boilermaker. Uh, Later in life, he became a union official with the local 83 of the Boilermakers. And eventually, when I grew up, uh, eventually I became, I got a job as a, at a, the uh, Darby Corporation in Kansas City, Kansas, first in Walker, making, rebuilding railroad cars. And that was a shop job. They were looking for all the welders they could get, hiring Anybody who had some could weld, you know, could get a job. So my father didn't pull any strings for me. Uh, so I worked worked there, and eventually, and I worked someplace else welding, and then I went back and worked in a different location at, for the Darby Corporation, what they called the shipyard, where during World War II they built landing craft there. Uh, and I think I might have worked someplace, but uh, for the bowl makers or for these, you know, the pipe fitters, uh, steam fitters, all these different things, field job, you know, if you worked in the shop, you got less money. If you worked out in the field, you made quite a bit of money. So all the guys probably who are working in the shops, or a lot of them, I don't know, probably wanted to be in the field, but there were a limited number of so I never asked my father, you know, to get me a job in the field. I would not ask him. And my father never, you know, he wouldn't, he was, uh, he wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have, 
picked me over somebody else, you know, or he would have wanted to, but he wouldn't have done that. I'll talk about my father later on and unions and prejudice and corruption and all kinds, all types of things. Uh, but <clears throat> the unions across the United States, not just the Boilermakers Union, but these other unions, they would get calls like Pascagoula, Mississippi, the shipyards would be calling these other across the United States. We need welders, you know. Uh, if you got any, send them down here. We got work for them. Things like that. So uh, my father's office got a call. My father would tell me from time to time, hey, they called for welders. And, you know, he told me, well, they called for welders and they need welders bad in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And I said, I'll, I'll go. So I loaded up the car and headed for Pascagoula, not Pascagoula, for, uh, yeah, I missed Pascagoula, Mississippi. And, uh, is that right, Mississippi? Anyway, it seemed like Louisiana. Somebody will know. Put it in the, because I forget now. I got to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I thought, why am I driving all the way down there? There's a union here. I just went to the Boilermakers Union and said, you know, do you need any wool? Yeah, we do. We have a convent, Louisiana. We have this group. So they sent me over to the lab to do a welding test where, you know, you put you know, a couple pieces of metal together. I think you, I think there was two or three things you had to weld, but put a couple pieces of, and then you weld. You weld it laying, laying down flat. You do one where you weld it, and then you have one, you know, something where you have to weld overhead. Then they take those three pieces of metal to a machine, and it, it bends it. They might also x-ray them, and I think they bent them. And uh, where the weld was should not break, or, you know, so I passed the test and they sent me out there and why am I telling you there was a reason that I was, oh, I think the knot was a knot, the reason. Anyway, I, in the motel also, before I went out on the job, I practiced tying the knots. Then when I went out for the, uh, oh, I know I was going to tell you later on about getting fired from there. So when I went out. Uh, for the job, you know, they set me up the towers to climb up there. And when I go up, I had a couple guys to help me, helpers. And they were local boys from Convent, Louisiana. I wasn't very old, uh, early 20s. And they said, Mr. Howard, would you, we had, these jackets on. I was very skinny, by the way. <laughs> it had, I had this jacket on, this thing on. If I had fallen, I'd have fell right through the, but anyway. They said, Mr. Howard, would you tie us off? You know, or tie me off. And the other guy, would you tie me off? So I, I tied them off and tied myself off. And uh, I think we can leave that subject because, by the way, I've been looking at this camera, haven't I? That's right, I switched, didn't I? This is uh, Barnwell, South Carolina. That's my mother. That is a federal government trailer. That's when my father was working at, uh, that's before he was a union official, when he was working at the Savannah nuclear H-bomb plant, building it. And I'll probably talk about that that time because there's some things that are interesting. I'm going to move over into story time. And I know you thought, okay, I got so many cameras. I only got two cameras here. 
going to move into story time. By the way, I told you I didn't have. Uh, I told you that activated ECHO. Uh, I told you I didn't have. Uh, I know what I need to turn off on that uh, thing. I just turned it on today on the ECHO. Uh, I turned on a thing that when it thinks it hears something, or when it does, just sound it as a, a sound. I didn't have that on before. This is 1971. I told you I didn't have pictures, very many pictures. Here's 1971. When I work, this is, you want to see somebody who looks gay? Not that there's anything wrong with it. Not that there's anything wrong with it, okay? But you want to see somebody who looks, looks gay? This is when I worked for Wells Fargo. 1971. Uh, that's a story I want to tell too. Um, has to do with, and I don't think I can say, <sighs> retarded. Oh God, I just did. They assigned me to a home for retarded children. That would have been about 1971, and I, I worked there about three months. I would have continued working there, except the people weren't paying, they didn't pay the bill. The people who ran that home. I made the, the last, the first, I guess, in the last uh, story video I made, I mentioned that I talked about St. and I'm going to talk about it again, St. Vincent's Church, St. Vincent's grade school, and I mentioned, you know, that I was baptized, my father was baptized there, all his brothers and sisters were baptized there, um, that I was baptized there, I had my confirmation there. I mentioned that I was married there. I Then I remembered later we were not. When I met Darlene, trying to switch cameras again. When I met Darlene, uh, she wanted to get married right away. I wanted to get married right away, but I wanted to get married in the Catholic Church and you have to post, uh, you can't just do it right away, you have to post has to be announced in the church for like three weeks and stuff like that. That's our wedding picture. And I remembered we didn't get married. We got married. She didn't want, she wanted to be married right away. And she didn't care if she had a Catholic ceremony, although she was Catholic. She didn't care whether she had a Catholic ceremony or not. But uh, we got married at their church, her church. Uh, her mother, by the way, I didn't realize for a while, was not a Catholic. I ended up being her, her mother's godfather. And uh, so I was the godfather of the wicked witch of, did I, I'm sorry, did I say that? I showed you the picture of the mobile, the mobile home in Barnwell South. The, there was a whole bunch of those, and they, I think they had other locations because it was building an H bomb plant was a uh, big undertaking, and the federal government supplied those. They didn't have air conditioning, by the way. It was in South Carolina, Barnwell, South Carolina, no air conditioning. My mother would get so hot, so upset, she would scream and yell at me to go out and turn the hose on the trailer, which I don't think helped. I would turn the hose on the trailer and steam would be coming off of it. <laughs> the trailer, I'm not sure that cooled the trailer in, but I guess her hearing the water on there, she thought it did. 
So I wanted to talk about this is the, the uh, grade school that I told you about. Remember, I told you last week that uh, I went to Holy Name first grade through fourth grade, and I went here to St. Vincent's, the fifth and the sixth grade. This is the church. This is the great school. This uh, was where the, the rectory, where the priests lived. I don't remember that so much. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it's, but this is the church. Remember I told you that I went to the drugstore, the right in the back of here was the their cafeteria. But right across from the corner here, right back here, was on the corner of, of 31st and Paseo, was a drugstore I told you about where I would go over there and have uh, a chocolate ball and a hot dog or hot dogs. And, and I did that for a long time until the sister, somebody told the sister that one of the St. Vincent's students was over there at lunchtime and she came over and drugged me all the way up here and into the church. So that Father Huber could discipline me. Um, I did it a, a few years back. I, I'm an old man now, I'm 75. But even if a year ago, I can remember at some point I told my kids, we had four kids. I told my kid, you, I, damn. The top search result for kids is make your own chocolate kit. It's $13.94 total. Would you like to buy it? No. I also found Tulip One Step 18 color tie dye kit. It's $24.36 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. All right. Check your Alexa app for more options. Echo Volume One. First time we've had that happen. Um, okay, how can you tell me where I just left left off? Oh, I can remember telling my kids, you know, hey, I had to walk through. We didn't have school, but you know, they were Catholic Catholic schools. We didn't have school. Well, maybe maybe there was, you know, the ones I went to. We didn't. We never had. A, I can count on on my hand the number of times I rode a school bus. When I went to high school, I had to take, to high school, I had to take the city bus there to the school and back uh, every day. So anyway, I, I, I was one of those parents who would tell their kids, you kids have it, so I have I had to walk 10 miles through snow and blizzards and whatever. I, uh, back a few years ago, I got to thinking, you know, and I went to, you know, Google Maps or whatever, and I entered the address that I lived at, 3510 Garfield, Kansas City, Missouri, and I entered in the church, the address, the, you know, and it's uh, a mile, it's 0.9, not quite a mile that I walked. So it says it would take walking would take 18 minutes. I guess it would take a little bit more for uh, of course they show I guess they do show two two options I think on the paths. And I didn't take either one. I I went over and took Woodland. So I started at 3510 Garfield, went over here to Woodland went down and then walked over there. So uh, 
Now the question is, if you watched my other story time, I told you that you were supposed to, at St. Vincent School, you were supposed to... Please, I can't find the answer to the question on here. Okay, there we go. At St. Vincent's School right here, for lunch you were supposed to eat in the cafeteria or go home for lunch. So the sister caught me being a bad boy. And so now, what did I do? A, did I start eating in the school cafeteria? Or B, did I go home? Did I walk the 0.9 miles home to have lunch? Have you made your selection? Of course, the answer is C. I did not eat in the cafeteria. I did not go home. I went halfway. Does this show it? No, it does. I don't want to go back to it. We'll get lost. Or whatever. Um, I went about halfway home, and there was a donut shop that had the most fantastic, it seems, you know, even today, the most fantastic glazed donuts. And I ate my lunch there. I had every day a root beer out of a glass bottle, not plastic crap, out of a glass bottle, ice cold. That was the best root beer. Those were the best glazed donuts. When I die and go to heaven, I think that's going to be... I know you'll all be up there with me, so find the donut shop. I wonder if the people who own the donut shop, who probably are in heaven now, I wonder if they're there. That was probably tremendous work for them and not much money. So they're probably someplace else, but you, you can come and see me in heaven. I will be at the donut shop eating those glazed donuts and having a root beer. By the way, this is Google Maps, so here we are. Let's go down here. Okay. Right back here was the cafeteria for the school. And right here, although it came out, right here was the drugstore. This is Paseo Boulevard, by the way. This tall tower you see here is the KCMO television tower. What was that TV show? Can't remember the name of it. But when it came, I think the show came to an end or whatever. Was that it? That somebody climbed up with a, up climbed up the tower with a sign, no, don't end the TV show or whatever. Also, right across from the TV, let's see, let me go down, let's just go down there. is the second hospital that I worked at, Trinity Lutheran Hospital. We're on 31st Street, approaching 31st and Maine. How long is this going to take? I worked at uh, Trinity Lutheran Hospital when the, I worked there in 1975 to about 1980 something.
Trinity Lutheran Hospital eventually was shut down. I guess without me they couldn't couldn't function. Okay, here we are. 31st and uh, Main. Anyway, um, What was I going? There used to be over here on this corner were, were two clubs, if I remember correctly, and they were got. It was very popular. There were guys who dressed as women and put on shows that people went there to uh, to see. Uh, on this corner where there's a vacant lot now with a bank and then this is the parking structure now when I went to work when I went to work for Trinity in 1975 parking was all you know at all hospitals parking was disastrous I can tell a story oh man uh, over parking. This parking structure was built when I was working there. And in fact, the director of security was off. I'm not sure if he was off because of his illness, his bad leg or what, but he was, he was gone for a while and I was the acting director of security and I was responsible for accepting basically this parking structure and underneath is receiving dock and a bunch of stuff. I forget how many millions of dollars it cost. I was the one that was responsible for uh, accepting it and then setting up the procedures for collecting money at the gates we had and uh, the whole thing. And. Uh, I was surprised when the director of security came back. He was, I got a million stories to tell about him, so I'll be talking about him a lot, Bob Ross. I was surprised when he came back, he was satisfied, happy with the accounting system that I set up and everything for the, and the only thing is, a couple of things. Uh, one thing that I told the, I was responsible as the day when he was back as the day shift super the day shift supervisor, I was responsible for seven parking lot attendants and and the security officers. Uh, I told the parking lot attendants that when employees were leaving when they got off, should just raise up the gate the exit thing, so they didn't have to use their car, just raise up the exit gate and let them let them. Let them go, you know, let them go. Let the day shift go, hundreds of employees, let them go, of course. And of course, the problem was you would have visitors um, who would be, would be in that group, you know, and uh, I said, you know, let them, let them go. Uh, don't worry about collecting the, you know, collecting the fee, just, uh, Let's get the employees out so they can get home. When the director of security came back, he said, "No, you know." He said, "No, no. You, you know, keep the gate down and let each employee use their card and collect the money from the, you know, visitors." Uh, and if I, I told the, you know, parking lot people, "No, do it my way," and we did it my way. Um, So anyway, the this hospital. Anyway, the hospital was open. This here, well, this building here was still there. Wasn't being used when I worked there. Uh, well, 
one time we had a I'm going to end it here in a minute with a little story which I never I didn't intend to tell this story just thought of it by looking at this this is when I worked at Trinity Lutheran Hospital um, the hospital had a blind rehab program where they had people who were blind who lived there and a lot of them I guess had had diabetes a lot of them too uh, I don't think you'd be but that when people hidden family members away when they were little because they had because they were blind or they hired hide them away for some other reason but a bunch of the people who were in that program had been kept at home and had had it and I think their, maybe their parents they couldn't take care of them any longer or they were grown or maybe their parents had passed away or whatever so they were they were to be to learn the skills that blind people should learn and to learn to be self-sufficient as much as they could or whatever but a bunch of them drank so they would be there, not get out much, but then at night sometimes they would get, they would, I, they didn't, they weren't kept there, you know, I mean, they could come and go as they wanted, but they would go out and they would get really drunk. So like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, I'm out there waiting for, well, it's when I was second shift supervisor, I was, we could look at, and I was over here on the other side, you know, waiting for watching for employees that were leaving, watching for the new employees that were coming in. And I heard a commotion or whatever, so I came up here to this ramp and whatever, and looked down here, and there was one of our blind rehab people, guys, out in the street right here, drunk, very drunk. And there was a car, like this car here, pulled up, and the guy or guys in it were yelling at him. I, I'm sure they did not know that he was blind. You know, they were yelling at him because he was in front of them. And they were yelling at him to get out of the way and threatening him or whatever. So I came on down here and got him out of the street. And then, and of course I told him who I was and everything. And then he started fighting with me and then I had to restrain him throw him down, handcuff him. Did I handcuff him? Anyway, I got him down. And then he started vomiting. So I made sure that he, I rolled him onto his side, made sure that his airway was clear. And then the police showed up and the police took him to the police station to book him and the police station refused he was passed out then the police station refused to take him because he was passed out and so they took him to I think it would have been instead of I don't think it was general it would have been no it had been Truman Medical Center then took him to Truman Medical Center no I know wait they didn't take him to the police station they tried taking him to the Psychiatric Receiving Center Hospital, Truman Medical Center's psychiatric unit. They refused to take him because he had passed out. So they took him to the regular hospital and he got into the emergency room and then he got, in, he got admitted. So the next day, you know, I come into, I wrote a report on everything and, and uh, turned it in. And the next day, the director of security, I go by his office, he says, Jim, come on in. Come right in, he said, uh, about that, uh, you know, guy last last night or whatever, uh, he, passed, he passed out and he aspirated on vomit and he has brain damage. And I said, oh no. And I said, I, you know, I, I made sure his airway was clear and everything. I, I said, oh, man, man. He said, yeah. 
So I went about my duties and later in the day, the director of security called me, Jim. He said, uh, got an update on, I think we probably used the guy's name, you know, but I can't remember, you know, got an update on uh, the situation. I said, oh, what's going on? And I said, I feel so bad. I felt like I feel like I did something wrong, you know, handled it wrong or something. And he said, eh, no, he said, uh, the reason that they thought that he had brain damage was because he couldn't see. They didn't know that he was blind. He's okay. He's been released or going to be released. They didn't know that he was blind and they thought that he had brain damage because, you know, he couldn't see. So, oh, wow. And of course I told the police, you know, the police who responded took him away. I, but anyway, didn't intend to tell that story, but it just came back to me with this, with this location. This is just before I went to work for Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Lloyd Aikens was his name. He was a security officer and he, he was midnight shift supervisor. And he lived a few blocks away in a very crummy apartment. And uh, he was coming to work and he was walking up this sidewalk in uniform with his weapon, of course, on. He's coming up the sidewalk and a guy comes over to him with a gun on him and says, give me your money. And Lloyd Aiken said, I don't think your gun is loaded. And the guy shot him. And Lloyd happened to have his, I guess, arm up like this. And the bullet hit his arm. And the bullet was defective. I guess maybe old ammunition. Who knows, you know. But it just barely broke the skin. And then uh, Lloyd went up right here. And ran down this ramp to the emergency, well, down this ramp to the emergency room. This would have taken him to the food dock. Ran down here and, to him, he, and uh, uh, that's just before, I went, a few weeks before, I'd already quit the other hospital or not. I hadn't left, I'd given them notice, two weeks notice. So I was wondering, and when I came over, the other guys were wondering, you know, why in the world didn't Lloyd just pull out his gun and instead he ran down to the emergency room. Uh, I'll be talking about Lloyd Aikens Got some interesting stories about him. I uh, he came. I picked him up one time. He didn't have a car. Picked him up one time. Brought him out to. Uh, he was hard to get along with. I I got along. I had a couple problems with him, but I got along. Okay. I got along okay with just about every hospital. When I worked as a welder out there, I didn't have any problems with anybody because I was underneath a railroad car or underneath a truck or someplace welding with a hood on. I never had any trouble with anybody. And as a security officer, as a security officer, I spent 30 years as a hospital security officer. It seemed like every hospital I worked at, first hospital, it was John Gallegos, the security officer who ended up being shot and killed. He was, I got along okay with him. I, uh, my wife and I had him and his girlfriend out to our house. Uh, he had us over to his girlfriend's house, made us real Mexican food. I I got along, I could get along, and then at, at this hospital at Trinity, it was Lloyd Aikens, he was midnight shift supervisor, and sort of had the same attitude. I, I was, I had a few problems with him but I was probably his only real, you know, his only real friend. I could get along okay with him. Then when I went to Research Medical Center, much larger, to, you know, we had 15 security officers here, and we had 25 security officers there. Uh, now at the first hospital, I got along fine with the director of security. 
at this hospital here at Trinity. I did four grievances and I won them all, but I, and he was, this guy was racist big time. Uh, you know, I actually liked him, but I had problems with him, but I, there was no, he eventually fired me and I was happy to be fired. I wanted to be fired. <laughs> I, mean, I hadn't been trying to quit. I could have quit easily, but I mean, I, I didn't want to be supervisor. I tell him I didn't want to be, I refused to wear my insignia because of, you know, uh, and then, but then the next hospital that I went to, a research medical center, the director of security was a fucking prick. Major time. I had no, he didn't, he hired me. He begged me to go to work for him. <laughs> And then as soon as I went to work for him, you know, he, I don't know if he forgot who he was hiring, uh, but no way. I mean, he was, he was racist. And when, I'm not sure with Bob Ross here that I could forgive, I couldn't forgive his racism, but at the next hospital, his racism, you know. And then there was one other, out of 25 security officers at Research Medical Center, there was one other guy who worked there, the supervisor, that I fucking hated him and he fucking hated me. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything good, you know. I mean, all these other, well, not all these, it'd be like two other hospitals. The guy who was a problem, the guy who nobody else liked. Uh, I got along fine with the guy, you know, with the person. The new hospital, there was no, no way I could even, I could barely be civil to him. And I wasn't civil sometimes, you know, and uh, so I only had to work, well, I worked that research for five years. Then I went to, by myself, basically, to Research Belton Hospital and worked there 10 years. Then went back to Maine Research for a year. Then went to Trinity Lutheran. I went to uh, Lee Summit Hospital for a year. And then I went back to uh, research Belton Hospital for about a year, then back to uh, research. I went back to research because I uh, put in for the job of bike patrol officer, and I loved that, even though that asshole was there. But I ignored him, tried to ignore him. So, and then that's when I retired in 2000. But I have a lot of stories to tell you, but I think I've told you enough for right now. It's uh, 4.30 p.m. Well, you can see what time it is. Okay, you know I'm lying because it's 4.23. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering how come these pictures out here, when my daughter and son-in-law were here for a vacation, we come to well, they came to it wouldn't be a vacation. Come, they came to visit us. I gave her a whole bunch of photographs, family photographs, because uh, they need to be passed on to somebody. And I'm not sure she wanted them, but she's big into photography though. But, Gave her these pictures. When I gave her the pictures, I thought, uh, seems like there's more, in the, and these don't seem that great. And then I just the other day was moving stuff around, and then I realized I had taken all the good photographs, ones I wanted to scan, ones I wanted to put on my blog or save, or pre I put them into some file folders to scan them. So I had those. So now I'm going to have to decide what I want to do with 
and even some others, and then send them to Ladana. Google Earth is pretty, you know, pretty neat. Man, brings back memories. Foot chases. There was a guy. There was a guy who was, who exposed himself. He, he had found out later, he wasn't just our hospital, Trinity, that he came to. Every few months he would come. He had, anybody went to, I, so he must have had a schedule, you know, okay, January and April I'll go to, and then he had a, must go to these other hospitals because they all, and uh, finally, I made con, that's a, that's a, should be a story to itself. It will be. But anyway, I ended up, chasing, I ran down the street, down the street here, and because there was actually the other officer in the patrol car. But let me tell you a little bit about it. I was going out to take down the flag. So I went out to Baltimore entrance up here. To, it's been uh, changed a little bit. <clears throat> I take down the flag <clears throat> and I uh, <clears throat> started to come out of the lobby and I saw a guy standing by the psychiat outside the psychiatric doors to the psychiatric wing. And I went over and uh, said, can I help you or whatever? And he said, uh, oh no, I was just, uh, can you tell me where? And he didn't say cafeteria, it's something that the military say. I forget what it, uh, not canteen, or whatever, but he asked me, and I said, okay, you're on the third floor now. You need to go take this elevator or the stairs down one floor, and that will take you into it. And then, so I started out, and then it hit me. Months before, the guy, he always had a red belt buckle. He had a red belt buckle this day, but I didn't see it then. Uh, I saw it later when I had him at gunpoint. Um, but then it hit me. Months before, I had ran in, run in, I had made contact with him, and he had said the same something about the same thing. And then it hit me, and I got on the radio right away, and called the officer who was out in the car. The officer who was out in the car was a veteran. He'd been, let's see, he was bayoneted in Korea and shot in the face, I think it was, in Vietnam. That was it. He was in the car, so I called him and I said, hey, he may come out the front. You know, he may come out the front door of the hospital there, and I gave the description, you know, and everything. And he says, I see him now. And he says, he's running. You want me to chase him? And I said, yes. And then, so that's when I come running out this door and go running down that hill. And then I heard the tires on that Jeep. He was driving our security vehicle, you know, a Jeep. And I heard the tires squealing. And I thought, oh my God, please. I can't remember his name. Should be able to. Him and his wife uh, came to our house and we went to their house. Uh, and I thought, please don't, you know, don't have an accident. Please, you know, that's what I'm thinking as I'm running down there. Because when I told him to get him, he intended to get him. Well, the guy, remember I told you, how did I get way over 
over here. Well, anyway, I don't want to, I'm eating up way too much. But anyway, remember I told you about the, that's a Penn Park building there. Going too far, turn around. Well, it's changed. But anyway, he came, he come, and the guy ran and the guy was jumping fences over here. There's a block or two in this area here. When he would jump the fence, this, <laughs> our security officer and it would be right there. And the guy would turn back around. By the time I got down, and remember I told you that down here was a couple of bars and one of them was at night, you know, they had men dressed up as as women performing and it was, there was a bunch of trees back there and all this kind of stuff and the security other security officer I can't remember his name you know called me and he said he's he's running back through and that's where I was I was right back back there and he was carrying a briefcase kind of made it easy when I described him to you know coming out he'll be carrying a briefcase and uh, so I could hear him coming through the brush, you know, running, coming through the thing or whatever. So I pulled my revolver out. And when he came busting through, I used a bunch of profanity and ordered him onto the ground. And he got down on the ground. And I handcuffed him and uh, turned him over. And there was his red belt buckle. That was what people would. I guess that was to attract it to, you know, that he, the guy would, so, so we had him. That, by the way, is the only court case I ever lost, not just for hospital security, but as a police officer, I never lost even traffic cases. I never, I know I never lost, although I didn't go to, I didn't care what they did, you know, I mean, that's another story. I, I didn't go in the court unless they called me when I went there for, you know, the tickets. I didn't hardly give any tickets. If I was there, I don't know if they, if the judge wanted to dismiss something before I came in, I don't care. And I mean, the other guys did. But I never lost a court case except for this one. The guy who was exposing himself to people and who we had a kind of a dangerous you know, if something had happened, if our vehicle had had an accident or if he had come through the bushes at me with his briefcase and with me not knowing what he had and hadn't stopped or, you know, whatever. One of the few times I, one of the few times I actually pulled my weapon. There was a few other times, but that was one of the few times. Went to court and lost that case. I think I'll come back to that. Uh, I better tell you now. How did I lose that case? So when the police showed up, I said, uh, the guy's been exposing himself to people. He's been here at the hospital repeatedly. You know, and they, they said, do you, uh, do you have witnesses? And I said, oh, yeah. So I went in on in the hospital, went over to the unit or whatever, like the unit secretary. Yeah, I, I was the one who called, you know, uh, who called. And I said, oh, so, so you saw the guy. No, a lady, this lady told me. And then, uh, won't stretch the whole thing out, but I, I messed up myself. What would happen, I remember he was right outside of the intensive care, sitting outside the intensive care unit one time. I, we, I got a call, I go down there, and a lady was, elderly lady, she was uh, upset. She said there was a, you know, a black man here and he was showing his, you know, exposing himself. And he, as it can be describing, you know, and he had a red belt punk on. And I went looking, you know, for him. And I put the word out for, you know, we all went looking for him. Every time he showed up, we all went looking for him. 
and we screwed up on not doing a proper report. We went to catch him and we didn't do the proper reports. We didn't have the person's name, you know, and, and inf information on them that they saw him, that they described, you know, we messed up on that. So I had, like I told you, I'd confronted this guy before and I remembered, I went and pulled up the log for the, my activity sheet where I had contacted this guy in the front lobby and I had told him he had no business being there and that he would be arrested for trespassing if he returned or whatever. So I told that to the police officer and said, okay, well, charge him with trespassing. Okay, so we go to court and uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, I may get into that later on, security officers are commissioned by the Kansas City, Missouri Board of uh, Private Officers Commission Unit of the Board of Police Commissioners. It's kind of a strange situation. Security officers have, I don't know what it is, since 2000, have full police powers on the property and in pursuit, in a hot pursuit. And Kansas City, Missouri police officers, unless it's a murder or something serious, they're not to go to court on arrests that, that we make. It's up to the security officer to go and do, do that. They don't want their officers tied up doing that stuff. They want to, you know, they... So I go to court and... Uh, but see, the police officer, of course, has to come and take the person, you know, and make out a little report and take him to jail and lock him up. The security officer doesn't go, you know. So the court case comes up. I go up with the other security officer with me. We go up and, uh, well, first of all, the, the guy who was arrested, he's, you know, your Honor, I shouldn't be here. And, you know, why shouldn't you be here? Well, because the the, the paperwork that I the, that he gave me, it says, let's say it was nineteen, let's say it was nineteen eighty. This says nineteen eighty two, but that was years. The police officer had written the date, and the judge says. Well, you're here, aren't you? So you know your court date is today, and you're here. So, and of course, the guy, the guy just keeps this up, and the judge says, "Listen, cut it out, or I'm going to uh, hold you in contempt of court. Now, stop it." And you know, so the judge wanted to nail this guy, and I don't know if I could tell then or not, but the front row were police officers, Kansas City, Missouri police officers, who had cases of their own, and they were like, man, man, I wish I could, you know, that was this kind of like, kind of feel it, you know. So then the judge says, uh, Mr. Howard, uh, how did he, well, he, he anyway, I think he, he did, says, okay, now what happened? And so I start telling what what happened? Well, I ran into the, the gentleman in the lobby, blah, 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 such and such a date, you know. And I told him then, he had, I checked him and he had absolutely no business being there. And I told him, if you come back, you will be arrested for trespassing. And the judge says, okay, well, how did he create a disturbance? And then I fucking knew. <sighs> the officer had written it up. I told the officer to make it, you know, and the officer had made him as disturbing the peace. So then I said, well, Your Honor, I contacted him outside, you know, the psych unit of the hospital on the third floor, Baltimore entrance. And he, then he left and then I, re, and then, then we started chasing him. And when we were chasing him, it, it, when we were chasing him, it was causing a disturbance. You know. The judge said, okay. Charges dismissed, and so the guy left. We went, the other officer and I, we went, he tried to avoid us. I mean, we weren't gonna go hit him or anything, but uh, 
I said, let's see what kind of a car he has. So he tried to avoid it, looked around, did whatever, and then we went to where we were. I could, we could look down and we could see, see him go to his car and we wrote down the description and the license number of his car. He never came back, but that's the only court case I lost. I messed up too when I, well, it wouldn't have helped me much because, but when I got to court that day, I should have gone to the prosecutor and said, I'm here for such and such a case. And of course, we didn't normally do that. And I should have seen what what, they, what, he, what he was charged with. But I couldn't have, and I wasn't about to lie. I mean, it wasn't, we just messed up big time on that. But the only court case I ever lost. Okay, that's enough for now. I. See, I didn't even get to this. This is the old St. Joseph Hospital. The first hospital I worked at, Linwood in Prospect. I was going to go into that, but I got sidetracked. Google Maps. Don't blame me. Blame Google Maps. Thank you very much for watching.